welcome to my podcast, Pen to Paper. My name is Claudette Evans, and putting pen to paper is exactly what I've been doing all my life, be it writing songs or stories. In my past life, I was a professional musician. For my sins, I played guitar, keyboards and sang for my supper, firstly in a dance band, sometimes up to seven nights a week. As disco took over, I formed a partnership with the drummer, opening a tuition and recording studio. Through this, I met six young men, all sufferers of muscular dystrophy, and we formed a band writing, performing, and recording our own songs. Freedom is a state of mind Look at me if you enjoy Feel it, touch your fingertips Just out of reach Chance of spotlight falling, burning through your soul. So with the freedom light and hold it tight. declined and upon the death of my partner I soon realized how I missed the thrill of performing live and after a couple of seasons as a solo act I was offered the post of musical director of a large coaching hotel on the south coast this was my dream job booking some amazing acts writing scripts and arranging and recording music for the nightly variety shows which included performing my own unique comedy spot, A Dorset Maid. Now, Vernon, you too can do this for yourself, because I know you fellas like to. So all you do, dear, is a nice deep thrust. Go on. Oh, beautiful Vernon. Oh, he's getting clever now. Oh, oh, look at this all over the place. Well, try an upstroke as well. Go on, you might as well. Oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Now, Vernon, at the same time that you're stroking it, do you think you could manage a little knee tremble at the same time? (laughs) No, Vernon, not like that, dear. No, not the one that finds your own railings, no. That's how the fella had the accident the other week. Just, you don't mind if I touch his knee, do you? He says, no, no, go on, she don't care. You all right? Do you want a bucket, do you? You're not going to wet yourself, are you? The seats take forever to dry. Just this knee, Vernon. Just a little up and down movement, dear. Just a little. Yes, I did say just a little, but I did mean a bit more than that, actually. You know what us girls are like. You can't do one without the other. So you would think, with that musical background, All my scribblings would be based around the entertainment industry and the many interesting individuals who crossed my path over the years. However, a mix of influences have shaped my writings. My father's tall tales and his love of the countryside, my mother's humanity and generosity, my own love of steam, dogs and exploring new places. Writing was an itch I needed to scratch. So many ideas racing around in my head from my adventures I shared with a Parson Russell Terrier called Busby. However, before embarking on this enterprise, I decided to do some creative writing courses to help me prepare and brush up on the basics of grammar. 
I also joined a writing group. You gain so much from listening to others and getting feedback on your efforts. Moving to Wales in 2015, my intention upon retiring from my day job was to write. So I joined both the Bridgend and Porthcourt U3A writing groups and Bridgend Writers Circle. And now I'd like to share with you a selection of stories and poems fellow writers from the BWC have thought good enough to award me some form of recognition. I'm starting with a story based on an early childhood memory called The Perambulator. And in 2016, it took first place for the memoir section of the BWC's Savica Shield. Elderly aunts with hairy chins and flat bosoms would donate dolls, and by the time I was seven, I had quite a collection of these china and porcelain creatures, with their chubby cheeks and undersized cherubic mouths. Their arms and legs moved stiffly in the sockets of their solid, unfeeling bodies. Some had large eyes that clicked over to reveal pink lids and long, wiry lashes, or the more sinister ones had fixed stares, seemingly following my every move from their static position on the wicker chair, where on cold, wet winter days I would play happily with my teddy bear and toy soldiers. It wasn't the weather that prevented me playing outside. It was Mother, who worried that I'd catch a cold or slip and hurt myself. Looking back, it was the freedom I loved, the air and the wealth of colours and textures the different seasons Mother Nature presented. The deep golds of autumn, the crisp white of winter as she cloaked the empty branches with fingers of ice, which melted onto the forest floor with a rhythmic dip, as the first signs of spring brightened the lengthening days. With summer came eight glorious weeks of freedom from the tyranny of the nuns. Father brought the teepee down from the loft and pitched it in the centre of the back lawn, behind the ancient gnarled lilac tree. Positioned so its outstretched branches would offer some protection from the noonday sun. Its distance being far enough away from the kitchen window to enable my mother to keep a watchful but unobtrusive eye on me, their only offspring, both in the autumn of their lives. I love the smell of the hot canvas and the way it rippled in the gentle breeze. All my dreams and secrets were secured within that fabric enclosure. My only confidant, our beloved Dashan, Mimi. The pram had been a gift for my last birthday. My long-suffering mother's hope that it would miraculously endow me with feminine qualities. The burgundy silver crest came complete with a fitted mattress, lace-trimmed pillow, pink satin quilt and rain canopy. Mother chose the prettiest of the dolls, Sally, to sit in this pristine carriage and would encourage me to take her for a walk. Once out of sight of the house, Dolly would be replaced by either Mimi or the neighbour's real scruff of a dog, Toby. I always enjoyed my father's days off, whatever the season, as there was always something new and exciting to do, and this day was to prove no exception. Following breakfast, I joined him in the garden, where he'd already dug up more than the normal number of potatoes required for dinner, and was busy picking peas, informing me that Uncle Evan and Auntie Roma were bringing Nana to visit tomorrow. Mother had insisted father mow the lawn after lunch, and he invited me to assist, but I was too tired. I'd already helped pick some strawberries, one for the bowl and one to pop in my mouth, and I felt I'd done enough for one day. So instead, 
I sat on the floor of my teepee, drawing and listening to Lonnie Donegan's Rock Island Line, a 78 vinyl on an old wind-up gramophone my Auntie Jane had given me. Then I had a brilliant idea. Mother was busy cleaning and washing everything in sight in preparation for tomorrow's visitors, and Father was now mowing the front lawn, so neither noticed my wheeling the pram from the lounge into the back garden. Leaving doll, bedding and canopy in the teepee, I proceeded to remove the seat insert, exposing the empty belly of this Rolls Royce of perambulators. Now it was fit for the purpose I intended it for. Having watched my father lovingly tend the garden and having under supervision helped, I fetched my tools from his garden shed and wheeled the pram to the bottom borders. My enthusiasm knew no bounds as dandelions, docks and anything I considered to be out of place found its way into the belly of my high-class wheelbarrow. Father tried to conceal his laughter and Mother was having difficulty containing her displeasure. She wasn't angry, just disappointed that her daughter had preferred soil and weeds to a dolly dressed in lace to grace this magnificent vehicle. My next offering is a poem, Visiting Grandma, set in rhyme, recounting the journey by steam train from my then hometown of Wimborne in Dorset to my grandparents' home in Surrey. Excitement unleashed, I was ready to go, all dressed in cornflower blue. A swift stop at the bank, Dad's money to get. No plastic, a tenner should do. Then quick march to the station, we mustn't be late. The train waits for no man, you know. I fidget and fuss, stand too close to the edge. Is it coming? I'm ready, let's go. Then I see the steam, hear the clickety clack. A whistle blows right in my ear. I run to the front, the engine to view. Merchant class 462, someone cheers. All aboard, shouts the guard as we race to the rear. I bags the window seat. Clickety-clack, we lunge and we lurch. A huge puff of smoke, such a treat. Press my nose against the glass, there's so much to see as we sail past old Pool Key. Next I spot sheep with their lambs, then a goat, some piglets, a horse. No, there's three. Counting the stations one by one, as through town and country we fly. Their names flashing past, far too blurred to read. I catch a letter. Was that a B? Tickets, please. A deep voice cries, then he punches a hole in each one. Southampton's next, ocean liners to view. Queen Elizabeth gleams in the sun. We disembark, but no time to rest. Trains waiting, we mustn't delay. Clickety-clack, a huge puff of smoke, and we lunge and we lurch on our way. A squeal from the brakes, crossing points noisily. As through Eastley we now race. Mother opens her carrier. Sarnies for lunch. My favourite? Now that would be ace. She unwraps the paper to reveal. Yes, it is. Squash tomato and hands one to me. Winchester Cathedral comes into view. I went there last year. Grazed my knee. Mitchell Dever, Basingstoke, Hook, then Fleet. There's open water. Is that the Great Plain? That's a nature reserve, my father explains. Farnborough looms, but I see no plains. 
we're crossing some water to the left and the right, now greenery on either side. Clickety-clack with a huge puff of smoke, we lunge and we lurch as we ride. Past Brookwood Cemetery's cold slabs of stone, Father tells me we're leaving this train as walking, walking, shouted long and slow, our belongings collected once again. On platform three, just two carriages long, the small engine looks so very strong. It's too far to walk for my little legs, though Warpleston's just one stop along. Then a short stroll along Leafy Prey Heath Lane, and my grandparents' house is in view. Their delight is to see us. Gramps lifts me up high, and Granny puts on a brew. All too soon the visit comes to an end. Then the journey repeats as darkness surrounds. And clickety-clack, a huge puff of smoke, and we lunge and we lurch. Homeward bound. The inspiration for Strangers on a Train, a story of pure fiction, though I am assured geographically correct, came from watching too many old black and white spy thrillers on TV. Boarding the train at the last moment, I discovered the seat my father had reserved was next to the corridor. Somewhat disappointed, I placed my suitcase in the rack. The normal musty smells of the aged coach were veiled by a heady, invocative scent, and a lady, wrapped in an expensive fur coat and occupying one of the window seats, sensed my curiosity. Ce soir de Paris. N'est-ce pas délicieux? I muttered a weak oui in response. She smiled, returning to look out the window as I took my seat and opened my father's treasured book. But that's how things had become since the rise of the Third Reich. Now we all sat, heads lowered, glances rarely exchanged, conversation minimal. That was the grip Hitler was bestowing, the Iron Cross of Fear. However, unlike many others, I knew I was not running away. Leaving Lubyanka on that day in February 1939, the rhythmic clickety-clack of the train's wheels enabled me to recall happier days when the carriages were filled with chatter, gaiety and children's laughter. Twilight descended as we passed through Tivoli Park and closing my eyes, I relived the walks I'd enjoyed playing hide-and-seek with Mother amongst its chestnut and tree-lined paths. So deep in my recollections of those joyous years, I hadn't noticed the train's brief stop at the park's railway station and was swiftly stirred from my memories by the sudden opening of the compartment's door. The bespeckled young man entered and sat down beside me, a little too close for comfort, forcing me to tuck myself deep into the corner, burying my head in Bradshaw's Continental Guide. The train rattled on through the marshland south of the capital and between the group of the hills of Notre Antioch, Greece, now swathed in snow, and onward through the pine-clustered village of Borovidnike, before looping deep to the south. I felt as though I knew every twist and turn of the track, having often accompanied my father on his trips to our consulate in Venice. Here, as the train circled north towards the heavily forested village of Verde, in springtime he would gaily sing, It's raining, grass is growing, and the forest is turning green. Onward we continued, 
west to Logatec, none of us suspecting the notoriety the village would attract upon the discovery of three mass graves, concealed for more than 40 years under the communist regime, following the end of the fast approaching war. The carriage lights flickered into life, elevating the gloom as we steamed through Rakek, heading towards our next stop, Postiania. Having now grown weary of attempting to understand the importance of the Victorian tourist guide my father had entrusted me with, I wished he had reserved the seat opposite the peroxide blonde, since I needed to remain alert, but changed my mind as she lit up another Sobrani cigarette. Excuse me, is that seat available? The speaker, standing in the now open door, was a tall, dark, handsome man in his early twenties, and the young lady opposite and I tucked our legs in readiness as he glanced around the carriage for an encouraging reaction. The perfumed lady lifted her head and answered in perfect English, but with that delightful French inflection. As far as I am concerned, yes, indicating the vacant window seat opposite. How did you know? Only you English carry a rolled umbrella and clutch your briefcase with such vigour, she replied. The train jolted forward, then backwards, propelling him into a speedy descent onto the worn upholstery, forcing a mon dieu from the elderly lady in the neighbouring seat as she tugged her navy serge coat free from underneath our new travel companion. Excusez-moi, madame, he stuttered. The perfume lady smiled. Are those the only words of French you know? No, actually, madame, I can converse in your mother tongue quite well. Excusez-moi! Her laugh echoed a tease. C'est mademoiselle, s'il vous plaît. In reality, French is not my mother tongue. And you, Monsieur English, are heading home, no? Yes, he replied abruptly, rubbing the heavy stubble on his face before offering her his hand. My name is Robert, Robert Byron. Nice to meet you, Monsieur Byron. And I am Maria Simon. She leaned forward, taking his hand, and by placing her other cream-satin-gloved hand on top, prevented him from removing his. Pray, tell me, what brought you to Yugoslavia? The noise of crossing several points prevented my curiosity as to his answer being satisfied. Impossible! she shouted. Looking up, I wondered what on earth she had asked him, and what had been his reply to warrant such a fierce reaction from our Mademoiselle Simone. The further conversation was delayed as the guard announced De Vaca, and the train slowed to a halt. Immediately my neighbour stood, quickly removing his valet from the rack to head down the corridor, slowly followed by the elderly arthritic couple to exit the train. Without delay, a young couple silently took the adjoining seats opposite, causing specks of dust to float across the dim carriage lights. Moments later, the whistle blew, and with three loud chokes and much grinding of metal on metal, we gradually pulled away from the station. Mademoiselle Simone smiled and stretched her long, slender black stockinged legs. Forgive me. I should know how to keep my own continence. After a moment's pause, he replied, Actually, it's a late business deal. Successful, I hope? The short conversation that followed seemed awkward until, slowing abruptly, we were for a brief moment plunged into total darkness. The compartment's lights flickered on and off creating the effect of a slow-motion film 
through what looked to be a heated, though whispered conversation between the two. Upon exiting the surreal gloom, Mademoiselle Simone stood up. Ah, we are nearing Bouvier, so I must say bon voyage, Mr. Baron, and à la prochaine. Until the next time struck me as a bizarre thing to say to someone you've just met on a train. Why the sudden exit? My heart raced, knowing we were now so close to the border with Italy. Should you not wait until we reach Sergeantia, he said. No, monsieur, I have arranged to meet my friends here. She replied curtly and was just about to remove her suitcase from the rack when the words, Have your papers ready for inspection? rang out along the corridor in Slovenian, German and Italian. And the train started moving once again. They search for communists, I heard the young man opposite whisper. And Mademoiselle Simone hastily returned to her seat as a baby-faced German officer stood in the doorway. Holding out his hand, he tersely shouted, Papers! He decided to commence with Mademoiselle Simone. Opening her handbag, she handed him her documents and offered the information on the reasons for travelling he had demanded. But as I had an extremely limited comprehension of German, the exchange that followed had little understanding for me, until one particular answer heightened his annoyance and he screamed, Stand up! Stand up! Immediately I felt my body temperature drop and trying not to reveal my inner fear, I noticed the young couple opposite grasp hands even more tightly than before. Standing, Mademoiselle Simone reverted to English. You are mistaken, Lieutenant. I am no communist. It was just a last minute change of arrangement. You shall come with me now, he commanded, roughly grabbing hold of her arm. Surely the lady may collect her suitcase, intervened the Englishman. Be quick, the German demanded, releasing his grip. Thank you, she smiled and turned, reaching up to the overhead rack, took hold of the handles of her suitcase, and swinging it down, hit the German with its full force, lifting him from his feet to fall onto the lap of Robert Byron. Panic gushed over me, as he restrained the day's lieutenant and nodding to Mademoiselle Simone shouted, Go! Go now! No one spoke as we watched her take the case and exit the compartment while the German slipped lifeless to the floor, blood seeping through his uniform from the knife wound in his left side just underneath where his heart once beat. As the train neared Cezanne, the Englishman rotated the dead German around, propping him up in the window seat, positioned so the spreading blood was hidden from view. Placing his index finger to his lips, he utters a silent shh, intimating for us to leave the compartment. But I and my three fellow travellers remain seated, frozen in fear. Eventually, the young girl spoke. You'll get us all killed! If you want to live, then I suggest you move. Now, he retorted. He ushered us down the corridor, away from the direction of the approaching soldiers, and upon reaching the carriage door, pushed us out one by one. As he jumped clear, there was an almighty explosion which rocked the carriage, lifting it from the ground, forcing it to lurch sideways before finally depositing it alongside the tracks in a flurry of snow. Helping me to my feet, he grasped my arm and ushered me away from the now chaotic platform and away from the station, distancing us from the cacophony of screams and shouting into a waiting Opal P4. The driver being none other than our earlier bespeckled fellow traveller, accompanied by Mademoiselle Simone. 
Let's go, shouted my excited companion. Lady Cynthia here has a date with destiny. Father said he'd meet me in Trieste, I said. It is too dangerous. Mussolini has allied himself with Hitler, he replied, handing me father's letter of introduction. So he sent us instead. I thought you were communists, I said. The Sobrani cigarettes? Mademoiselle Simone laughed rather flippantly. Is father safe? I asked. Yes, and God willing, you'll be reunited in Switzerland within the week. Mercifully, Mr. Byron sounded confident. Why such desperate measures for a travelogue? I asked. Page numbers, names, and places. How should I know? I believe your father holds the key. And let's say, we're just strangers you met on a train. He smiled. And now, we've an even longer journey ahead of us. I'm delighted to say, visiting Grandma and strangers on a train received enough points for me to win BWC's Savica Shield in 2017. I'm concluding this episode with my haiku poem which, in 2018, won the Keith Cole competition. Winter, a haiku poem. Spiders spin their webs. Rivers rage, geese are leaving. Winter's fingers grip. you've enjoyed my scribblings. Writing is very much like learning to play a musical instrument. Practice, practice, and even more practice. The important lessons I've learned throughout this process. Research your subject thoroughly and paint believable characters and interesting locations. But most of all, like me, enjoy doing it. Putting pen to paper, that is, albeit using the modern technology of an iPad or computer. Well, coming up in the next episode, I'm going to share with you some of the wonderful writings by a fellow member of both the Bridge End Writers Circle and Bridge End's U3A, nonagenarian Jean Harding. So until the next time, get writing! <laughs> <laughs>